Hello everyone, I am Dr. David Perlmutter and welcome again to The Empowering Neurologist. Our guest today is uh, someone very special in my life, Dr. Alan Gaby. Uh, Dr. Gaby was actually very instrumental in kind of creating the space for me 30 years ago to begin exploring uh, ideas as related to neurology back then and then more generally uh, moving forward through the years. We're going to talk about uh, that uh, later in the uh, interview, but let me tell you a little bit more about doc Dr. Alan Gaby. He received his undergraduate degree from Yale University and then his MS in biochemistry from Emory. Uh, he got his uh, medical degree at the University of Maryland and then was in private practice for some 19 years. During that time, uh, specializing in nutritional medicine and really uh, serving as a, a powerful uh, source of information for all of us who were exploring uh, nutritional medicine at that time. He is the past president of a group called the American Holistic Medical Association. Uh, I became a member of that uh, a couple of decades ago as well. Uh, Dr. Gaby has really done his very best to get information out there as it relates to nutrition. He has uh, testified uh, to the White House Commission on Complementary and Alternative Medicine, uh, basically focusing on the cost effectiveness of uh, the idea of giving people supplements to their diets, in other words, nutritional supplements. Uh, his early book is Preventing and Reversing Osteoporosis, published back in 1994. The Doctor's Guide to a Vitamin B6, published even before that, 1984. Uh, and he's written uh, numerous uh, scientific uh, papers in the field of nutritional medicine. Uh, he has been a contributor to something called the Townsend Letter for Doctors and Patients uh, since 1985. And he served as a contributing editor to uh, another journal called Alternative Medicine Review between the years of 1996 and 2010. Over the past 36 years, he's developed a computerized database of more than 28,000 individually chosen medical journal articles that really um, focus in on this whole notion of integrative medicine, of natural medicine, nutritional medicine, and he uh, has served on the clinical faculty, faculty of uh, Bastyr University uh, in Kenmore, Washington between uh, 1995 and 2002. Uh, he's been on the CBS Evening News, uh, he more recently completed a project which is uh, something he's been engaged uh, in uh, for over 30 years, and that is this textbook called Nutritional Medicine, uh, which has now been uh, fully updated now in its second ed uh, edition. Uh, Dr. Gaby, in the creation of nutritional medicine, reviewed more than 40,000 research articles uh, and this is a book that approaches some 400 different health conditions. Uh, it contains uh, more than 60 chapters or around 60 chapters that deal with uh, the utilization of therapeutic agents like vitamins and minerals, amino acids and other uh, natural uh, substances, including looking at them, how they are used, what are their biological effects, uh, when should they be considered? What are their clinical indications? Uh, what are the signs and symptoms of deficiencies of, for uh, example, these uh, vitamins and minerals? How uh, might they cause adverse effects? And I think really importantly, how do uh, various supplements that we might take uh, possibly interact uh, with various medications that we may be taking? So uh, we look at what are called nutrient interactions, uh, both uh, and, and also looking at things like dosage and administration. Uh, he has uh, chapters that focus on uh, certainly the dietary fundamentals that we all need to be aware of, but also considers things uh, like food additives and uh, does focus, and we're going to talk about it today, on something called reactive hypoglycemia, whereby uh, individuals drop their blood sugars quite precipitously. Uh, as Dr. Gaby will explain, that's actually a fairly common problem. We're also going to look at low thyroid function called hypothyroidism and even hopefully touch upon uh, candidiasis, chronic uh, yeast infection. The book is 1,456 pages. That's a lot. That's uh, as much as 12 times uh, the number of pages uh, as a, a typical book. And it is... Um, this book, Nutritional Medicine, is clearly, uh, I would say, a foundational cornerstone that, uh, my opinion, should be on the desk of 
uh, every healthcare pr uh, practitioner, whether they're involved in nutritional medicine or not. So we have uh, a whole lot to talk about today. Let's get started. Well, Dr. Alan Gaby, it is really nice to see you again. Thank you, Dr. Perlmutter. It's great to see you too. Long time. It, it is a long time, and I, I'm going to tell a brief story here, and I told you earlier I was going to do this, and um, many years ago, uh, I, shall I say more, about 30 years ago, uh, I was, uh, went to a dinner here in Naples, Florida, uh, and a lecture by a guy named Bernie Siegel, and I was fortunate enough to sit next to him at dinner, and at that point, I was uh, being a neurologist, which is a cool thing, I, you know, but I was very dissatisfied with it all. Uh, for reasons that are not really germane for today. But he said, you should learn about something called the American Holistic Medical Association. Uh, and I had never heard of it. He said, their next meeting is in Seattle, Washington. Uh, so uh, fast forward, I'm in Seattle, Washington. I go to, I signed up for your lecture. And I sat in the back because I didn't know anything about what you were talking about, or I didn't think I did. And uh, you were talking about giving vitamin infusions with vitamin C and magnesium and B complex in a vitamin. And, uh, you know, to me, it was, it was initially very challenging because it's, it's certainly nothing I had ever heard of in medical school. But the part that really got me was when you started talking about your results with people, giving them what was called then, maybe it is now a Myers cocktail, IV vitamin C. I went back to my uh, mainstream neurology practice and I was changed for life. Uh, there was no going back. I had turned around from the shadows in the back of Plato's cave, allegorical cave to seeing the light because of your lecture. And I, I realized there was a lot more going on out there than I had ever been exposed to. Uh, grateful to you, grateful to Bernie Siegel. The other person whose lecture I went to at that meeting was a small group discussion I think eight people around a table with this fellow. I believe his name was Jeffrey Bland. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, man, I got the one-two punch between you and, and Dr. Bland. So if I've never thanked you for that, I'm doing so right now. Well, uh, it's my pleasure, and my life's work has been to, uh, to figure out uh, what works in nutritional therapy, which, as you know, is not taught in medical school and to teach uh, others uh, who are willing to listen. And the, the Myers cocktail was, was something that I, I kind of learned from Dr. Myers, but kind of changed it and made it up myself, but I named it after him. And it's just amazing what it can do. It can knock out acute asthma attacks in two minutes. It can knock out migraines in two minutes. Uh, it can rescue people with end-stage heart disease and have them live years instead of days or weeks. So uh, I've been teaching that for a long time since you were there, and uh, there are probably several thousand doctors in the country doing it now, but it's still uh, a minority. Well, it's all thanks to you, I guess, and Dr. Myers. Uh, I found it exceedingly helpful when a patient would come into the office unannounced in, th in the throes of a migraine headache. And, you know, th the teachings for us were really to give them narcotics. Uh, we found that you know, inhalation of oxygen along with some IV magnesium with vitamin C really did the job very, very quickly. And they could even drive home uh, as opposed to, you know, giving somebody some Demerol or Dilaudid and then, you know, they're kind of stuck and then that wears off and they still have the problem. So again, thank you for that. And the book is really, as I said in the introduction, it's really magnificent. And uh, you haven't seen the introduction yet, but uh, I, I really felt that um, it's something that whether you're involved in nutritional medicine or not, you need this knowledge because even as a mainstream uh, practitioner, uh, mainstream doctors need to know what the interactions might be between even the supplements that their patients are taking and the medications that they are prescribing. So I think it really uh, is a, a very big vacuum, I think, in medical training. Whether you choose to employ supplements or not, you should at least know the interactions. Well, absolutely. and. Uh... There are some mainstream uh, medical courses that talk about that, um, but I've been astounded uh, at how, how poorly uh, some patients have been managed in the mainstream medical community. For example, you give people Lasix or some of these diuretics that suck the magnesium out of your body through your kidneys, and then you get multiple symptoms, anxiety, fatigue, even dementia. Uh, and I've seen a lot of people over the years who I would say were Lasixed into oblivion. 
And, uh, you know, the drug is necessary for certain things, but you have to know that it pulls the magnesium out. And I saw one person who was put into a nursing home with Alzheimer's disease. She just had serious drug-induced magnesium deficiency and uh, chronic severe anxiety due to magnesium deficiency from diuretics. That's just one example. And uh, if the medical community can't even learn that, <laughs> what hope is there to teach them how to actually use diets and nutri nutrients to treat their patients? That's, that's what my book is largely about, is how to use dietary modifications and nutritional supplements, usually orally, not usually intravenously, but sometimes. And there is an entire massive body of knowledge. There are over 17,000 reference citations in this book. And when people say there's no evidence, it's like, you know, I'll drop this eight pound book on your foot. You'll see how much evidence there is. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I know what it's like, uh, you know, been up against uh, people who challenged various uh, parts of our programs over the years, giving them the, the peer reviewed studies in their own journals, though oftentimes met with disbelief. Um, you know, interesting, you, you bring up right off the bat this uh, uh, idea of Lasix and certainly other more commonly used uh, diuretics. I think uh, as it relates to magnesium, uh, do you find that it certainly uh, may be more helpful to look at an intracellular magnesium level as opposed to simply a serum magnesium? Well, that's been looked at. And uh, my conclusion has been that there is really no readily available, reliable method of determining magnesium deficiency. The only really reliable one is you give people an intravenous large dose of magnesium and then you collect their urine. And if most of it comes out, they weren't deficient. Uh, and if most of it does not come out, then they were. But that is expensive and it's unwieldy. Uh, intracellular levels do not correlate that well. You're talking about maybe white blood cells or cheek Red swab. Cell. They don't correlate very well with levels in the muscles. So I think uh, magnesium deficiency is what we call an empirical diagnosis, which means you make an educated guess. Uh, you do a therapeutic trial, which means you give them some, and uh, if they get better, then yes, they had deficiency. Uh, so the other thing is, uh, let's take heart disease. People with heart disease have a gross deficiency of magnesium in the heart because of the disease. And then it makes it worse because of the deficiency. But if you were to do any laboratory test for magnesium other than a biopsy of the heart muscle, which you're not going to do, it won't show up necessarily. So that's why a lot of uh, holistic and nutritional medical care has to do with taking a good uh, medical history, doing a proper physical exam. Uh, lab tests may or may not be useful. Often they're not. And then you, based on what's published in the medical research and based on your clinical experience, you try therapies. The good part about it is these therapies are almost universally very safe, and they're generally not very expensive. So it's kind of like, why not give it a try? And as it relates to heart disease, what about dysrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, uh, things like that? Yeah, it's hard to get rid of atrial fibrillation with supplements, but you can get rid of this stuff they call PVCs or premature ventricular contractions. And there are some serious arrhythmias, kinds that are life-threatening, where they've actually documented in the cardiology literature, you give a magnesium and it, it settles it down. So yeah, definitely in the field of cardiology, there's a place for both oral and intravenous magnesium. And if people don't like to take pills, they can in increase their intake of whole grains, nuts and seeds, fruits and vegetables, and they'll get a lot more that way too. Let's just, before we leave magnesium, you know, from our perspective, as it relates to the brain, probably threonate, magnesium threonate might be the best choice. Uh, as it relates to, let's say, heart, uh, what would be the best type of supplement? Well, I'm not sure it's been been worked out. I think uh, the aspartate uh, is very useful. There's some old research from Germany using uh, magnesium aspartate or the combination of potassium magnesium aspartate. When I find that to be most useful is in the treatment of chronic fatigue. It works better than other forms of magnesium. Uh, and for muscle cramps, and sometimes for these arrhythmias, the PVCs that I mentioned, I think the aspartate works better there. Uh, other than that, and I've tried to look at this because people always ask me, uh, and they say, well, magnesium oxide, it's poorly absorbed, uh, don't use that. Uh, but if you look at the studies, magnesium oxide, number one, if you supplement with it, the urinary level of magnesium goes way up, which means it had to be absorbed. Number two, there are at least six double-blind trials with six different health conditions where magnesium oxide was effective. Now, it may not be the most efficiently absorbed, but it's cheap, and the number of milligrams of magnesium per capsule is, is a lot more than other forms because it's 
elemental magnesium compared with only 20% or so for magnesium citrate or some other forms. So I'm not averse to using the cheap form in this situation. There are a few areas where I might switch to others. I'd say that, you know, you, you've talked a lot about uh, diuretics uh, over the years. And I think one of the areas we're seeing more and more being related to hypomagnesemia, or low magnesium and even low potassium is the ketogenic diet. So a ketogenic diet does tend to lead to a bit of a diuresis, and as such, potassium and magnesium tend to follow suit. So I just think a word to the wise of individuals who are on a ketogenic diet and having issues like headaches, muscle cramps, et cetera, consider a magnesium supplementation. Absolutely. The other thing is, um, as it relates to the diuretic, we're seeing uh, new research talking about how diuretics might elevate uric acid and how uric acid may be influential as it relates to weight gain, uh, insulin uh, resistance, uh, even hypertension. So uh, have, you, have you seen much of that literature as, as of late? Um, I haven't. I'm aware that uh, diuretics can deplete potassium, and the, there's a thing they call rebound edema, where the, the swelling is actually caused by the diuretic, which was originally given to treat swelling. Uh, and one of the treatments is to discontinue the diuretic and the swelling will go up for a couple of weeks, but then the body will uh, reset itself and it'll be better than it was before you discontinued it. So I, have, I haven't seen that particular thing that you mentioned. Well, interestingly, diuretics are, are often used for congestive heart failure with the notion of, uh, of offloading the load uh, and therefore uh, allowing more, uh, uh, improving the ejection fraction. Uh, that said, though, ultimately, if you're depleting magnesium, you're, are you not working against yourself? Well, you are. And uh, diuretic-induced magnesium deplet depletion is probably responsible for what they call diuretic refractoriness, which means it works for a while, then it stops working. Same thing with asthma drugs. Asthma drugs deplete potassium and magnesium, and you need particularly magnesium uh, for the bronchial passages to remain open. So... Uh, a lot of these drugs would be safer and would work better if they were combined with the, the appropriate nutritional supplements. Now, since you mentioned heart failure and diuretics, they do help. Um, I don't know if they prolong life, um, but conventional medicine looks primarily at how to deal with the effects of the problem. And nutritional medicine often looks at how to identify the causes of the problem. Uh, why is there heart failure? It's because the heart is weak. And uh, how do you make the heart stronger? Well, if you look at energy metabolism, you got these little intracellular things called mitochondria, and they produce the energy that is necessary for the heart to beat. Um, what is necessary for the mitochondria to work? Magnesium, coenzyme Q10, and a few B vitamins, and iron. Now, iron deficiency has been documented in 50% of people with heart failure. And when my dad, at the age of 93, was hospitalized, the cardiologist had no idea about this. He didn't even know how to test for iron deficiency. So I had to take him to the internist and uh, order the proper tests. He was very deficient in iron. We gave him an oral supplement, and within three days, he felt a lot better. So uh, this is a uh, very common thing, iron deficiency and heart failure, and it is even being overlooked by cardiologists right now. They, a study came out a few months ago where only about 10 or 20% of hospitalized patients with heart failure were even tested for iron deficiency. And of those who were documented to be deficient, they were not given the proper treatment. These are uh, systemic failures of modern medicine. This is not a question of alternative versus conventional. This is substandard medical care and some of the nutritional therapies are so well documented that there's absolutely no excuse for, for not doing this. Many of the other ones, you know, people could complain, well, it's not a double blind study. And I'd say, well, yeah, well, most of the stuff you do isn't either. Uh, but, you know, for the, for the stuff that's the best documented, we really need to push uh, and, and tell the medical community, uh, this is not alternative medicine. This is standard high quality care and you need to be looking at it. I can't let this one go. Uh, you mentioned that being so important for the heart to work uh, appropriately is having adequate amounts of coenzyme Q10. Y you know where I'm going, <laughs> uh, going with this, because probably the most common drug used in heart patients uh, is, is going to be one form of statin medication or another. Uh, so how do we reconcile the, uh, this whole uh, issue that statins deplete CoQ10, a necessary component for heart muscle activity? Well, the most obvious answer is to uh, 
supplement with coenzyme Q10 if people are taking a statin drug. And I'm told, uh, I have not verified this independently, but I've heard from multiple different sources that Merck, the drug company, which uh, originally came out with Lovastatin, which was the first um, statin drug, uh, they own the use patent for combining uh, Mevacor, which is their Lovastatin drug, with coenzyme Q10. So they uh, are allowed to do that. And they bought the use patent and then they buried it. So apparently, I don't know if it's expired now, but they knew that it depletes CoQ10, and yet they buried that information. I guess they didn't want people to be afraid of the drugs, but uh, anytime I see somebody on a statin drug, I tell them to take at least 30 milligrams of CoQ10. Uh, there are about five or six controlled trials on statin-induced muscle problems, and it looks like approximately one quarter of the people that have statin-induced muscle problems can do much better with the muscle problems if they add coenzyme Q10. The other three quarters, I don't know what's going on with them, something different. <laughs> Maybe they probably need magnesium. Uh, I will say, I've heard the rumor as well, and I'm not gonna uh, try to independently verify that for you <laughs> right now, but that's uh, urban myth maybe. Um, you, you really, uh, you cover 400 different clinical conditions in the book, but you seem to emphasize the notion that there is really, may I say, epidemic of undisclosed or undocumented low function of the thyroid. So subclinical hypothyroidism, uh, you, you take a position that that is really rampant. So uh, wa walk us through why you believe that and what people should be doing. Yeah, I didn't make this idea up. I read a book uh, by Broda Barnes called Hypothyroidism, the Unsuspected Illness. It was published in 1976. And this was when I was still in my medical training. And uh, I said, well, if this guy is uh, telling the truth, there's some uh, major problems out there and we can do a lot with it because you give a very low dose of thyroid hormone. And uh, over the years, I would say close to 20% of the people that uh, I saw in my practice uh, had, I, I don't call it subclinical, I call it sub-laboratory because okay. uh, the lab tests are normal. Subclinical hypothyroidism actually has a different definition related to certain lab tests and things. Sub-laboratory is where the people have the classical symptoms and the classical physical signs of underactive thyroid, and yet their lab tests are normal. Their Achilles tendon reflex, you hit, the, hit them with the hammer and it comes back very slowly instead of normally. And they've got uh, dry skin and they've got puffiness around their ankles and maybe below their, uh, their eyes. And they've got a multitude of symptoms, cold hands and feet, uh, fatigue, depression, dry skin, menstrual irregularities, constipation, trouble concentrating. Not necessarily all of them, but they have enough of these, plus uh, delayed Achilles tendon reflexes, low body temperature, which by itself is not diagnostic, but it's, it's another data point. And then you put them on a low dose of thyroid hormone. I usually use the natural kind for various reasons, mainly that it works better in some cases than the synthetic form. And people come back, uh, if I were to look at my 20 uh, most dramatic results with all of my patients over the years, at least a quarter of them would have been sub-laboratory hypothyroidism. People come back and say, I never knew it was possible to feel this way. You asked me if I was depressed and I said no. But after I went on thyroid hormone, I realized I was depressed my entire life. Um, so I gave you this figure of 20%. Now I have to qualify that because when one person gets better, they tell everybody in the neighborhood and everybody else who has the same symptoms show up at my office. And so it's a selected sample. So I don't think it's as high as 20% in the general population, but it may be 10% of people who have clinical hypothyroidism, but normal lab tests, and you need to find a doctor who's willing to try you on a low dose of thyroid hormone, and it may be a life changer. That's been my experience. Uh, like I said, about 20% of the people that I saw did a trial of low dose thyroid hormone. Can we unpack a little bit further uh, your rationale for not using a pure T4, uh, uh, a synthetic thyroid pure T4, and opting instead for a, a probably combination of T3 and T4? Yeah, well, um, this is what Barnes said in his book. Um, so I figured, okay, maybe he knows what he's talking about. He spent his whole life doing this. Um, but the differences are possibly twofold. Number one, the human thyroid gland secretes both T4 and T3. Now, the endocrinologists will tell you that the body can convert T4, which is inactive, 
into T3, which is active, and it's kind of like a reservoir time release. And therefore, you can just give T4 and the body will take what is needed. But the problem is, these people are not healthy. So why should you automatically assume that it will make a perfectly efficient conversion? And in fact, some of the reasons people have problems is because genetically they don't have the, an efficient enzyme that can convert T4 to T3, uh, or they have nutrient deficiencies like selenium or zinc, which is necessary to convert T4 to T3. Uh, so you can give the combination, which is commercially available, uh, Euthroid and some other products that contain both of these. But what Barnes said is that there's a third, a possibly a third hormone in there known as diiodo tyrosine, DIT, diiodo tyrosine. Now, the endocrinologists, again, will tell you that this is not biologically active. Uh, we do know, though, from a 1912 study that diiodo tyrosine is the maturational hormone for tadpoles. So it is not entirely biologically inactive. In addition, uh, Dr. Uh, Myers, who, who I named the Myers cocktail after, used to give diiodo tyrosine therapeutically, and he thought it was beneficial for fibrocystic breast disease. So it is quite possible that diiodo tyrosine has an effect. According to Barnes, natural thyroid hormone is better for swelling of the tissues than the combination of T4 and T3 is. So uh, different people do better with different products. Some people do better with synthetic T4, but it's the minority. Of the people that I could see that made it where they could tell a difference, probably 80% preferred the natural form. And this has now been documented in a randomized trial published in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism about seven years ago. They switched people from the T4 synthetic to the natural uh, thyroid hormone that comes from the animal, and the great majority of them preferred the natural form. So I think the point you're making uh, is that a more active form of thyroid to do what the thyroid hormone is supposed to do in our bodies is T3. And the difference between T4 and T3 is, is T4 has four iodine uh, atoms on it, and you need to pull one of those iodine atoms off, and the enzyme has to be active that allows that to happen, and that is dependent on adequate amounts of certain things like selenium and zinc, and that uh, you really want to be sure you're giving those so-called cofactors, so they're, they're available uh, in an amount to allow the functionality of that enzyme so that people who are taking this synthetic T4 only can then manufacture this active form of thyroid T3, which is a, a, a process taking place, let's say, in muscle and liver. Right. So um, there are probably you know, quite a few people out there for whom uh, the medication really isn't doing its job because they're not doing that conversion. Right. Um, there's another factor, too, and that's what we call tissue resistance to thyroid hormone. Uh, forget about whether they're making the T3 adequately. Some people are, and yet their cell receptors don't recognize the hormone as efficiently as they're supposed to. And uh, this is considered rare in mainstream medicine. They've only described a few hundred cases in the medical literature, but these are the most severe cases. And what we find uh, statistically, when you find a rare disease that is very serious on a genetic basis, you usually find a less severe manifestation of the disease, uh, which is much more common. And I think that a lot of these people that I'm treating um, have tissue resistance, and you just raise the level up of the hormone in their body some, and that overcomes the resistance. Now, could that resistance be brought on by the fact that they're receiving supplemental thyroid hormone? Um, I don't think so. I, I think what you might be driving at is uh, they make antibodies against the animal tissue that you're giving them. Is that no, just you're... down regulation of the receptor vis-a-vis -vis insulin receptor uh, resistance. Okay, I suppose that's theoretically possible. Uh, what I find um, clinically is when I give people thyroid hormone, uh, they have to up the dose once or twice, and then they reach a stable level. I don't like to use high doses. I like to do nutritional therapy plus low-dose thyroid hormone. Every once in a while, after six months or after a year, they have to crank it up one more notch. But generally after that, they don't have to. So I don't think it induces resistance in the way that you're suggesting. How effective is following basal body temperatures in titrating your uh, thyroid intervention? Well, that's a very good question. That was one of Barnes, Broda Barnes's main points, is that the body temperature is low, they're hypothyroid. hypothyroid. And as I came out of medical school, I didn't 
know anything about this. And I used to use that. But over the years, I discovered that there are quite a few people who have low temperatures who do not have clinical evidence of hypothyroidism. And there are a lot of people who have clinical evidence who are normal temperature. So I have come much more to rely on the Achilles tendon reflex. When you hit that Achilles tendon with the hammer, it's supposed to come back up fairly briskly. And if it doesn't, uh, if you look at the textbook of physical diagnosis, the DeGowan and DeGowan textbook, or the one we all used in medical school, it says that low Achilles tendon reflex, slow, slow reflex, is diagnostic of hypothyroidism. So I've begun, I, I began to rely on that much more than the body temperature, and I think it predicts better who's going to respond to the treatment and who you shouldn't try it on because they might get side effects. The other uh, interesting uh, deep dive that you did had to do with this the notion of reactive hypoglycemia. So maybe you could just walk us through what that term means, and then we can talk about how does, what are the manifestations, and beyond that, what people can do about it, and how common it is. Sure. Okay. So this is a controversial area because uh, the nomenclature is not clear. Hypoglycemia means low blood sugar. When your blood sugar is low, uh, you get a whole bunch of symptoms. You get the fight or flight reaction, anxiety, fear, uh, sweating, hunger, fatigue, things like that. Or you could get a slightly different reaction. If your body is not capable of mounting the fight or flight reaction, you get what I might call screensaver mode. You try to, you start to like fade out. Um, you can either pass out or uh, just get severely fatigued or just falling out. Uh, so one of those two events occurs when you have hypoglycemia. Now, the idea is when you eat uh, too much sugar or if you have a poorly regulating hormonal system, you eat and then the body overreacts by pumping out too much insulin and that causes your blood sugar to drop below where it was before you ate. And that leads to these various symptoms. And the treatment is to discontinue the sugar, discontinue the blood sugar destabilizing substances, which are mainly caffeine and alcohol, and eat frequent meals, eat whole grains uh, instead of white bread, and supplement with various nutrients that regulate blood sugar better. Uh, that would be chromium, magnesium, zinc, and B vitamins, and things like that. So that is the basic concept of reactive hypoglycemia. However, a lot more people have this syndrome that responds to the same treatment that I just mentioned, clear out the sugar, eat frequent meals, et cetera, take the supplements. A lot more people have that than can be actually documented on a blood sugar glucose tolerance test to have this drop. Sometimes people get the symptoms when the blood sugar is high. Sometimes the blood sugar drops and they don't get symptoms. So this is why mainstream medicine has criticized this as a panacea, something that is grossly overdiagnosed. <clears throat> so in my chapter on hypoglycemia in the book, I spend a lot of time uh, explaining actually what I'm talking about. And I'm, I'm really not talking about hypoglycemia. I'm talking about a syndrome that has been called hypoglycemia that responds to the same approach. One thing that they found out is that when you uh, have this endocrine reaction, the insulin level goes up and the insulin itself actually causes problems. It pushes certain things into the brain uh, and it causes various symptoms because of the insulin itself, not because of the low blood sugar. So um, basically what I do is I ask people, do you get symptoms at 11.30 in the morning or four o'clock in the afternoon? And if they do, then that usually means there's a blood sugar problem and that they will respond to this treatment. Uh, do you crave sugar? Do you uh, feel transiently better after you eat sweets and then you, you get a crash? Things like that. So uh, the chapter goes over what to ask people and uh, what to do if they have it. I do not generally do a glucose tolerance test because, for that very reason, because many people who benefit from this program actually have a normal glucose tolerance test but I think it's one of the most common problems that we see is some type of, uh, Je Jeffrey Bland referred to this as the NICE syndrome, N-I-C-E, nutritionally induced chronic endocrinopathy, which is a disease of the hormonal system. So there's something going on there. Maybe Bob Dylan would have said there's something happening, but you don't know what it is. <laughs> there's an old Dylan song. And he would have sold that title along with everything else. For 300 million. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, um, so I have a high index of suspicion that people need to clear out the sugar, caffeine, alcohol, eat frequent meals, and take certain supplements. And 
it's just amazing how many people have that problem and how, how many people do so much better when they make those changes. You mentioned uh, Dr. Jeffrey Bland, and uh, I think I mentioned him in the intro as well. Uh, we recently, uh, our viewers will recall, uh, we, we had a nice interview with Dr. Bland talking about the notion of senotherapeutics, the notion of uh, cellular rejuvenation, really uh, giving cells uh, more of an opportunity to replicate and resume good function, which is really, I think, central in the whole discussion of how we age, but certainly also central in the discussion of the capacity of the immune system um, to, in, through multiple channels, protect us acutely and, and chronically. So these days, uh, that's front and center in everybody's uh, mentality. What can you do uh, for your immune system, both the innate and adaptive immune systems. Uh, and let's talk today then about what we can be doing or should be considering at least uh, from a nutritional supplement perspective. So, yeah, I mean, what's on everybody's mind today, of course, is this virus. Um, and uh, some of this has to be inferred from other evidence that we have, but uh, there's reasonable evidence that if you uh, cut out the sugar from your diet, various aspects of your immune function will improve. Uh, there's also evidence that if you identify hidden food allergies, and uh, hidden by their nature, they're not obvious, you, you don't necessarily feel bad right after you eat this food, uh, but with a uh, supervision of a healthcare professional who is uh, tuned into this, you do an elimination diet where you cut out common allergens like wheat, dairy products, eggs, uh, coffee, tea, alcohol, things like that. And then you introduce them one at a time and you can see if your symptoms that you have go away on the elimination diet and then you can trigger the symptoms with individual food challenges. I did this with probably 2000 people and it's just amazing how many uh, conditions over a broad spectrum of specialties, anything that ends in ology is likely that there are many conditions that are due or at least made worse by hidden food allergies. And if you're constantly eating foods that you're allergic to, your immune system is working hard to deal with them. And if you discontinue them, you, you give your immune system a rest so that it can deal with uh, other things that may come along, like virus infections. Now, as far as supplements, um, there's fairly good evidence that uh, when somebody gets uh, sick with an uh, infection, even a cold, the level of vitamin C drops precipitously They've actually demonstrated that it drops as low as what you see in people with scurvy, which is severe vitamin C deficiency. And it takes multi-gram doses between three and six grams a day to bring the levels up to normal once you get a cold. So if you've got a cold, you wonder uh, how much worse it would be as if, if you get COVID. Uh, I know that some people or doctors are giving uh, a gram and a half every six hours intravenously in the hospital to COVID patients. And there's not a lot of published work, but the, uh, the reports are anecdotally that it's helping people. So uh, what I would do if I, uh, I try to keep my vitamin C intake up at the very minimum, two or three times the recommended dietary allowance. So for me, that would be 200 to 250 milligrams a day. And if I were to get an illness, I would start with uh, much higher doses. I probably would go a, a gram every hour uh, until diarrhea or uh, stomach ache, which is what they call the bowel tolerance therapy. And then I gradually increase it until uh, I get there. Um, and I had a patient with mononucleosis one time, a 20 year old kid. And I said, let's do bowel tolerance vitamin C. He was able, believe it or not, to take 6,000 milligrams every 30 minutes of vitamin C without getting a stomach ache or diarrhea. And I did give him intravenous vitamin C too, but he was back to normal in 48 hours. So yeah, vitamin C, and again, don't, don't do this bowel tolerance thing without supervision of your healthcare practitioner, uh, but definitely make sure you're getting adequate C before you get infected. The other thing uh, that's important is zinc. Um, and uh, we need to, the, the American diet is a little bit low. So a supplement that contains 10 or 20 milligrams is often useful. Uh, zinc should be balanced with copper because zinc, excess zinc can cause copper deficiency. Uh, if I catch the COVID, I'm going to, uh, I have a little stash of zinc lozenges here, zinc gluconate. I use the brand name Cold Ease because that's one of the ones that's actually been shown in studies to reduce the duration of colds by 50%. But we know that uh, there's, there's circumstantial evidence, let's say, that the coronavirus uh, will not get into your cells as easily if you have enough zinc around 
And since the cells where it enters is in the mouth and lungs, uh, you want those lozenges to release the zinc right there in the mouth. So I probably would start on zinc lozenges, four or five of them every day for several days. And the last thing here that's, uh, well, two more things. Uh, vitamin D now has, has been shown to be effective in preventing hospitalized patients from getting put into the intensive care unit. And so uh, I usually recommend 800 to 1200 units a day, which is a lot lower than many doctors are recommending because I'm concerned that excessive doses of vitamin D can cause problems like kidney stones and possibly even heart disease. But in the, uh, in the studies that are being used, they used a, uh, a vitamin D analog known as 25-hydroxy vitamin D, and they gave the equivalent of maybe 30 or 40,000 units uh, as a uh, huge dose when people got sick. And the number of people who had to go into the ICU was only 2% compared to 50% of people who did not get the vitamin D. So short-term high-dose vitamin D seems to be useful as part of the therapeutic approach and moderate doses just to make sure you're not deficient if you get infected. Finally, I'll mention uh, Sambucus nigra, which is uh, black elderberry. It's a fruit, elderberry is a fruit, and the, the uh, juice from the fruit is used medicinally. It's been used for centuries to treat various types of respiratory infections. There are some studies that show that it reduces the duration of the flu by more than half. There is a study in the test tube using what they call a chicken coronavirus. This was a virus that causes uh, bronchial disease in chickens. And in the test tube, uh, black elderberry inhibited the replication of that virus. We don't have any studies on uh, Sambucus uh, as a treatment for COVID, but it seems something that I would reasonably consider uh, based on what I know. Now, I also know that some people have warned against using black elderberry because they're afraid it might trigger what's known as the cytokine storm. Cytokines are these inflammatory molecules in the body, and there's strong evidence now that the reason people with COVID get very, very sick is the body has an overreaction, an inflammatory reaction that then damages their lungs. And you don't want to do anything that's going to increase that reaction uh, and that's why they give uh, prednisone or drugs like that to reduce that inflammatory reaction. So the basis of the claim that uh, elderberry increases cytokines is a test tube study with the white blood cells of healthy volunteers. And that really does not correlate at all to human beings in a, a clinical situation. In fact, when they feed the stuff to animals, it actually reduces the cytokine output. So based on that minimal degree of evidence that we currently have, my current approach for me, if I were to get sick or a family member, <clears throat> I would uh, hit them really hard with Sambucus early in the disease, and I probably would not give it if they were seriously ill. One, one final anecdote here, and then I'll, uh, I'll stop talking. No, you're um, doing great, by the way. <laughs> thank you. Our son, uh, who's now 20, uh, when he was nine, he got the swine flu. That was 2009. Everybody in his class got the swine flu. They were all out for two weeks. Um, when he got sick, we bought this uh, product called Sambucol, which was the only widely available commercial elderberry product at the time. We gave him one tablespoon an hour, every hour while he was awake. And this was higher than the recommended dose, but we figured, you know, it's just elderberry syrup. He was perfectly well in 30 hours. Everybody in his class, it took two weeks. So that's an anecdote. I know it's not double blind, but I like to tell that because I was impressed. We're hearing more recently about uh, melatonin and that uh, for a number of reasons uh, in terms of its uh, immunological properties. But one uh, study that came out, uh, uh, a paper actually on JAMA online, was talking about why children seem to be doing better. And one of the reasons, aside from the fact that they're not likely to have chronic degenerative conditions, obviously, uh, they've had more um, exposures to things in their young lives likely to be more recent off of immunizations as opposed to people our age who may or may not get a flu shot. But that said, they said their melatonin levels are higher. And there's been some discussion that melatonin on board uh, is worthwhile as it relates to COVID. And even beyond that, that interventional melatonin at significantly high dosages that I, I'm not, never had experience with uh, might be worthwhile as well. Any thoughts on melatonin? Well, I've looked at that. I know melatonin is used for a lot of things other than sleep problems, and, and there's some effectiveness there. 
Um, the stuff that I've seen on COVID is still, in my opinion, in its early stages. And there's so many things we can do, uh, things that I mentioned, uh, that uh, I probably would not include melatonin in my current, in my own treatment regimen. But, you know, it's uh, moderate doses seem to be safe, especially for short term use. Well, let's, now that we were on COVID, uh, let's just for a moment, uh, if I could get your sense as to why th there is this nexus of individuals who have coronary artery disease, diabetes, obesity, uh, chronologic uh, aging, why do you suppose they have much higher risk for bad outcome? That's, that's a tough question. Everybody's been trying to figure that out. The hypertension is... Uh, probably one of the biggest risks. And I assume it's even people with hypertension that's controlled. Uh, my guess there is that it has to do with something with this uh, ACE2, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme number two. Uh, there is a receptor on the cells that uh, it's called the ACE2 receptor. And uh, that's how the virus gets into the cells. It binds to this receptor. And we know that a lot of people with hypertension, uh, or we think they have something wrong with their ACE2 receptor. So it may be the fact that they had hypertension, not the high blood pressure itself, but the fact that whatever is wrong with them that raises their blood pressure also uh, increases the risk of it getting into the cells. Diabetes, people they have chronic inflammation, they have very poor immune function. People with heart disease have chronic inflammation. So it may just be that they are have multiple illnesses that just makes them less capable of dealing with this rather nasty infection. Uh, but with that said, even, even then, and, you know, all deaths are bad, but the death rates are not uh, catastrophically high. I mean, you get 6%, 7% in seriously ill people. There are people in nursing homes that are 85 years old who go through this with just a few symptoms. So um, we still have a lot to learn. Um, and yeah, those are good questions, and I wish I knew more about it. Well, uh, I got to open up. A, uh, I hope, hopefully, it's not a can of worms here, but uh, I'm going to go to this place anyway. And that is, we're seeing the introduction now of these mRNA-based uh, immunization protocols. And uh, I have come out uh, cautiously optimistic about the, the the way this is all constructed. That we, you know, we trick ribosomes into making proteins that mimic the spike protein, and therefore. It's not as if we're introducing an attenuated vaccine. So uh, are you comfortable sharing your thoughts? Well, um, I'm not an expert in this area. I have always been a little afraid of vaccines. I mean, we, we did vaccinate our kids, but we were kind of slow and the pediatricians all yelled, us, yelled at us because we were behind. Um, I don't know enough about this. What I would want to know is it, when they did the safety studies, how many people did they vaccinate who were 85 years old or, or who had comorbidities? A lot of times when they're doing safety studies, they exclude all the people that are likely to have problems. And uh, am I going to take this thing immediately when it's offered to me? Probably not. I'm going to wait six months. And, you know, I'm not everybody has to make their own decision on this. And uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I'm not 100 percent convinced that it's safe or let's say uh, let's say that it does. Uh, provoke uh, resistance against the infection. Uh, I look at myself, age 70, who's actually in pretty good shape. I don't have any of these comorbidities. Um, and uh, I would likely survive just fine. So I, you have to consider what is your risk of having a catastrophic outcome if you get the infection? And you balance that against uh, the unknown risks of the vaccine. So at this point, uh, to me, the answers are still unknown. Well, I think that was a very pragmatic response, and I'm, I'm, I appreciate that. And I, I feel similarly. I think risk of bad outcome for myself is would be extremely low. We don't know what outcome risk is going to be for, a, may I say, a significantly untested vaccine protocol, though there has been you know, extensive uh, numbers of people who've gone through this. The timing has not allowed long-term assessment in terms of its safety. And the other thing that's been raised as of late that I think is worthy of consideration is might not there be some antibody cross-reactivity with some other antigen in the body similar that looks similar to these proteins uh, that make up the, the spike component of the actual virus itself. Uh, unknown. So I, I think uh, uh, my choice will be to consider having it, but like you, I'm going to stay healthy and continue on with all of uh, Dr. Alan Gaby's recommendations uh, for, for many years. 
Um, let me uh, thank you for that information and also thank you for all this great wisdom for today. And again, the book, Nutritional Medicine, in this, uh, this is the first revision, so it's the second edition. And um, it's Did a you give the website in your introduction? Did you tell people where they can go look at the book? No, that was my next question. So okay. where can they look at the book? Yeah, drgaby.com. It's all spelled out, D-O-C-T-O-R-G-A-B-Y. Dot com And it has uh, sample chapters there. I mean, it is written as a medical textbook, but probably 25% of the people who get this book are not healthcare professionals. And they, they want to just know what is available out there and they can show it to their doctor with all the references. Well, through the magic of post-production, the website is appearing on the screen right now <laughs> as we speak. Who knew? Uh, having, having said that, um, We'll see. Uh, we certainly want people to be able to read a sample chapter. I think that it'll really uh, help get their uh, uh, appetites going as it relates to this knowledge. Uh, Alan, it's it's really great to see you. We've never played guitar together, but I know that's something I've always wanted to do. So let's see if the time comes when we can get together physically and, and, and make some music. I hope it does. It's been great being with you here. Okay. Talk soon. Well, once again, thank you to Dr. Alan Gaby uh, for such wonderful information today. Uh, the book is called Nutritional Medicine. You want to get the second edition, the revised edition, and uh, really a powerful a compendium of information that we can all use, whether, truthfully, we are healthcare practitioners or uh, people practicing health care, self-care. A wonderful book, Nutritional Medicine by Dr. Alan Gaby. This is The Empowering Neurologist. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter, and thank you so much for joining me today. We'll be back soon. Bye-bye.